Right, hello there ladies and gents, welcome to another repair video. Today we're going to be working on this Nintendo Switch which has been sent in. And this console has been sent in because, and I quote, it's lagging on all games. So, I'm going to be completely honest here, I have absolutely no clue what could be possibly wrong with this. But, that being said, we're going to take it apart and see what we can do about getting it fixed. So, okay, it's got some charge in it. So let's just see what's actually going on. Alright, so it doesn't seem to be lagging there. A little bit of lag there. Okay, that's definitely lagging. So while I've got your attention, if you're new to the channel and you like this type of content, please be sure to hit the subscribe button and turn on bell notifications so that you're notified whenever I upload a video. And if you want to support the channel, you can do so by using some of the Amazon affiliate links in the video description. And if you set one of those affiliate links to a bookmark, then every time you use Amazon, I'll get a little bit of a kickback. And that would be absolutely awesome. Okay, so yeah, that is definitely lagging. Interesting. Ooh, laggy laggy. Wow. It seems I can't actually do anything, it just locks up. I'm going to hard reset it. So, a game that's installed onto the EMMC is definitely 100% lagging. And, wow, that is very slow at boot up. Wow. And there isn't even that much on here. Space available, 25.3 gig. Space available, 100 gig. Yeah, that's definitely lagging. Okay, well, interesting, to say the least. Well, this is definitely different, that's for certain. This is an early version as well. It's the XAJ1001, so this is going to be a jailbreakable switch. So what I could do is I could put it into RCM mode. And I could do a scan on the EMMC. I want to also hook it up to my bench power supply so I can see what kind of current is being drawn from the system. And the reason for that is because if it's got a high current draw, then it could be a power related issue. Like I said, I have no clue here. So far, I have no clue what could be causing this. So this is definitely a little bit different and it's definitely a little bit out of comfort zone. Okay, so looking inside, it looks absolutely clean. There are, there's no signs of liquid damage. There's no signs of anyone poking and prodding inside at all. So what I'm going to do first, I'm going to hook this up to my bench power supply. And I'm going to try and figure out whether it's a power issue or not. So... I've got a breakout cable just here. Um, this breakout cable goes to my bench power supply. It's basically the guts out of the, out of the battery for a Nintendo Switch, just the circuit board. Um, that breaks out to a, a splitter where I can connect it up to my bench power supply. And I can provide it with 4.2 volts as if it's got a full battery. So that saves me having to mess around with batteries and things like that. It's really, really convenient. All you have to do is slice uh, this part of the battery away take the battery board and then you can just solder some wires to it and it works really well okay so as you can see in the top left hand corner i've got the power supply up on the screen so what i'm going to do is i'm going to turn it on and i'm going to watch the current drawer and see what goes on it seems normal so far
and then it hangs. Okay, in terms of current draw, it seems low. It seems really low in terms of current draw. So you can see here that it's drawing just over 700 milliamps at times, you know, closer to 800 milliamps at times. Power consumption seems low. Realistically, with the screen connected, with the backlight connected and everything else, when the screen is actually on and showing, it should realistically be drawing closer to an amp, and sometimes just over an amp. So, I'm going to check the screen brightness and make sure that's not what's causing that. Okay, so that's maximum brightness. And yeah, even still, that's not that's not quite drawing what I would expect it to draw. 4.2 volts, 700 milliamps roughly when it's in use. Let's load up a game. Uh, maybe not. Uh, let's pop in the game card. Ah, damn it. I uh, kind of unplugged it there. So this is one of the beauties about having a breakout cable here. It allows me to monitor current draw. Did you see that jump to 500 milliamps there? That should never jump to 500 milliamps at the first boot screen, ever. It should not bump up to that high. It should go up steady. That was a sudden spike in power. This might be a power issue. Yeah, again, it's it's not quite drawing what I'd expect it to draw. Let's start software. Damn it. Okay, I need to I need to connect up the game card. Well that sucks. Sorry, not the game card, the SD card. Oh, that's annoying. And again, not draw oh there we go. That was a spike. That's normal. So now drawing one amp. That seems okay. But again, I don't know if it would expect to draw more. I think it probably would because one amp is generally when it's just got the display on. Hmm. <laughs> I can't actually press A. That's annoying. Hang on. Let me go another another joy con. Okay. That's better. Hmm. Power consumption still doesn't seem quite right. It's less laggy, but still laggy with the bench power supply connected. And I've got this capped at 5 amps, so it's not going to be a current draw issue in terms of the power supply. It seems a little bit less laggy, but it's not, it's not quite there. As in, the logo here, this little loading icon, that seems fine, that's not... Well, now it's froze. Oh, there we go. Uh, yeah, that seems fine, it's not It's not jittery, it's not... Uh, you know, it's not. there's no tearing or anything like that on the screen. But it keeps freezing up, as if it's trying to load the software, but can't. I don't know. I think we'll probably be here all day if we're trying to do that. So let me show you what I do expect. So, here's another switch. And I'm going to have to connect a game card reader to this. 
And I'm going to do the same with this one. I'm going to hook up the bench power supply and let's monitor this. Let's see what kind of current draw we're getting with this. This switch works, by the way. You see that big spike to one amp there on the second boot logo? That is normal. That is what I would expect. Huh. <laughs> Keep shutting off. I think that's the bench power supply doing that. But look at the spike in power. One amp. Did you see that? I don't know if it showed up on the screen as one amp. It was only for a second. But that's what I'm expecting to see. I'm not expecting to see 600 milliamps. Damn you. Oh, that battery's dead. Damn it. Anyway. That switch doesn't like the bench power, bench power supply, that's for sure. Some of them don't. Some of them act weird. Second boot logo. Yeah, it's not drawing enough power. It is not pulling enough power to run this system. Pulling a bit, it's, it's operating by the look of it on around about 60 to 70 percent power, and that's no good, which would explain the lagging. And let me try and explain why because I can explain why in my head, but then when it comes out, it might be different. But let's say, for example, we've got a CPU. Well, we have, we've got a CPU right here, but let's say, for example, we've got a CPU. And you apply 1.1 volt to that C 1.1 volts to that CPU. If that CPU needs 1.1 volts to operate at correct voltages, then it's going to work fine. However, if you apply 800 millivolts, so 0.8 volts, it's not going to operate fine, is it? It's not going to run at full spec. You're going to downclock the CPU. So what I think is happening here is the CPU is being downclocked, possibly because of a power issue. I could be way off base here. I very well could be way off base here, but it appears as though the CPU is downclocking to a lower frequency because it can't get enough power. Either that or the CPU is getting so hot that it's downclocking on its own, but that's not the case. It's not getting hot. It's not running that hot. So another thing that could an issue is some sort of a thermal sensor so if a thermal sensor has gone bad then it's possible that the cpu could be down clocking itself because it thinks that it's overheating so it could be thermal throttling and that could also cause lag i think that came out okay i think now the problem is we don't have schematics for this board which means i do not have a clue where the thermal sensors would be I'm assuming that they're going to be close by to the CPU because they want to be able to get maximum, uh, you know, ma maximum uh, accuracy. But again, I don't know. I'm going to have to do some research here. Now, it's one thing in theory, but it's a completely different thing if I sit there and run tests and it doesn't show anything up. It's going to be very difficult, to, in my opinion, to be able to diagnose this issue. I'm going to give it a go. I'm going to give it a try, but... Whether or not that is the case, I don't know. So the way most thermal sensors would work is with a resistor. So a normal resistor, uh, you know, it would be a certain certain resistor, something like a, a 1K or a 100 ohm resistor or something, whatever it is. But basically, as things get hotter, the, the resistance would increase. So basically what would happen is the resistance would increase and that would tell the system how hot it is based on the resistance and voltage drop across the resistor. So basically, that is, you know, in a nutshell, how a thermal sensor would work. But like I said, I don't know where the thermal sensor is on this. 
I don't have a clue. I genuinely don't because I've never had to deal with it before. So I'm going to inspect the board. I'm going to see if I can figure it out. I'm going to see if I can find it. Ah, what's this here? We have corrosion. Very slight, but we have corrosion on this board. This is liquid damaged. Okay, well, that's just giving me something to go off. So I've just sat there and explained thermal centers and things like that. Probably for no reason. Well, it's still useful information. Right behind this connector, there's a very, very important chip. It's called the anti-piracy chip. I don't know the official name for it. That's just what we call it in the uh, the biz. But basically, there's an anti-piracy chip. Without that chip, you can't play games. You'll be able to turn the console on, but you can't play games. And you can't replace that chip. So one of the things that a lot of people probably already know by now is that while I'm taking a console apart, I'm not just blindly taking it apart. I'm not just unscrewing screws. I'm actively looking at the board. Wherever I'm focusing on for the screws, I'm actively looking at the board. And the reason for that is purely because as I'm going around with the screwdriver, unplugging everything, disconnecting all the ribbons, unscrewing the screws, etc., etc., I can focus on that one set area and look for signs of damage, signs of blown components, liquid damage, etc., etc., and... Sometimes it will give me a general idea of what's going on with the board. In this case, like I said, I can see corrosion on this board. You're not going to be able to see it properly. Yeah, there we go. Now you can see it properly. It's corrosion on the board. And, yeah, okay. We've got something to go on. That's excellent. Right, okay. So I've just enjoyed myself a nice cup of coffee. And now we're going to take a look and see what we can do about getting this working. So I can very visibly see some liquid damage here. And I've got a feeling there's probably liquid damage under this chip here, which is the anti-piracy chip. So let's take a look under the scope. Let's see exactly what damage we're dealing with. And hopefully, let's get this thing fixed. Okay, so here's the first bit of damage here. And it looks like it's got very hot around this audio IC area. Now, like I said, we don't have schematics for this, so I don't actually know exactly what this area does but what I do know is it's definitely definitely not good all right so we yeah we've got some damage around here so this is the s1715 I don't know the chip manufacturer or anything for this but what we do know about this is that it is the anti-piracy IC and basically without this we are pretty much stuffed this is a BGA chip and as you can see under there We've definitely had some exposure to liquid there. So definitely a little bit of damage. And then directly on the other side, we've got some damage to the SD card and touchscreen connector as well. So we've got the SD card, the game card reader and touchscreen connector. But I think just cleaning this bit up should be absolutely fine. I'm going to pop a bit of isopropyl alcohol there. And... I'm going to give it a scrub with a toothbrush to clean up this area. And I don't want to clean everything up at once because I need to make sure that I can see all of the liquid damage. And I did just speak to Jason from Jason's Electronics Repair. There'll be a link in the video description to his channel, but I did just speak to him and he said he has come across this once before. And he determined it as a anti-piracy chip issue. So he couldn't fix that one, unfortunately, but... That's what he determined it as, which is pretty much the same conclusion as what I've come to here. Or at least it's a partially same conclusion. So what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to clean this up as well. So basically what I'm doing here is I'm going through the board and noting the damage. Because let's say, for example, you work for the FBI and you go to a crime scene. This is basically a crime scene. And you're not going to get rid of the evidence before you log it. So, yes, I'm not sitting there and writing it down, but I am logging it in my head. So, mentally, I'm sitting here and I'm logging all of the potential damage and all of the potential evidence of the issue, or the cause, rather. 
So we're going to find the perpetrator. We're working for the FBI right now. We're going to find the perpetrator and we're going to bring it to justice by eliminating the perpetrator. Hey, listen up. If anybody need me, I'm going to be working a big, big case for the FBI. <laughs> anyway, is that more signs of liquid? Mm, maybe, maybe a little, but not anything I think I should be concerned with. So let's continue inspecting. I think it's contained to this area here. So let's clean it up and let's see how bad it actually is. So now that I know where the damage is, I can afford to clean it up. I think I might be replacing a few components around here. So there's a resistor right here. And as you can see, this resistor here is very charred. So I'm kind of wondering if this resistor is bad or not. Oh yeah, that's definitely bad. <laughs> well, that just popped clean off. So I'm going to have to replace that. Don't know the value, but I do have donor boards. So I'm going to add some flux. So flux is going to help solder to flow. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and restore that pad. Because if I don't restore the pad, then I need to figure out where it goes. So I'm going to try and restore the pad. So I've got some leaded solder. Hmm, I think that pad is gone. Yeah, that pad's gone. Well, that kind of sucks, doesn't it? So now I've got to figure out where that pad actually goes to. So let me clean that up. Let me see if I can figure it out. If I can't figure it out, I'm going to have to trace it based on another board. All right, I'm going to grab a donor board. I'm going to figure out what's going on with that circuit. Or what's meant to go on. So this is the resistor in question. So... What I'm going to need to do is I'm going to need to remove the resistor from this board and basically try and figure out where it goes. I've got a feeling it might go to a wire and it might go through to another layer on the board, which means I might have to dig. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to add some more flux to the donor board. And I need to add flux because I want to keep this as clean as I possibly can. But I, I want to wick this away. So I want to basically clear up this area. So obviously I don't care about the donor board so much. But I want to figure out where the resistor's got to go. Because I'm going to have to solder this on one side and run a jump away by the look of it. Okay, so... Looking at the colour change, it's difficult for you to see, but if you look at the colour change, and in fact, if you look at the shape, in fact, so you can see the pad just here, and then you can see an outline. It looks like it's going to this big trace here. So if I scratch this trace away, just a little bit, and then with my multimeter in continuity mode, I'm going to probe that big trace. And I'm going to probe the trace which is gone. And we get a beep. So in continuity mode, that path from there to there is continuous. And it's not ground. So checking against this point here, which would be ground... And it's not ground. So that means that we need to run a jumper wire from the big pad to where it would solder onto the resistor. Now that's going to be rather difficult. It is going to be kind of tricky because it's a 0201 resistor. It's not going to be easy, but it is going to be doable. So here's the one I'm working on then. And like I said, we need to complete that circuit. So, all I'm going to do, I'm going to take my X-Acto blade, 
and I'm going to expose some of the trace. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to clear this away. So I'm going to clean away the residue which I've just left by exposing the trace. A bit of isopropyl alcohol. And a cotton swab will do. And that is nice and clean. So now what I need to do is I need to create a new pad. And the way I'm going to do that is using a little bit of jumper wire. And I'm going to solder it from this point here to this point here. So as I can reconnect a new resistor and complete the circuit. Because without that resistor there, that circuit is incomplete. And that circuit is not going to work. So let's just add a little bit of flux. Not much. Just a tad. And then I'm going to add some leaded solder. And I'm going to tin this area here. I'm basically prepping this area to accept the jumper wire. Just like that. So next I'm going to take some jumper wire. So this jumper wire that I'll use here is 0 0.17 millimeters in size. I know that sounds tiny but it's not that small but what I'm going to do is I'm going to solder some of the jumper wire to this point here so this is enamel wire but I have already got part of this jumper wire exposed but I'm going to solder the jumper wire there and then notice I'll put it on an angle so it's on kind of like a about a 30 to 40 degree angle, something like that. And I'm going to trim it off. Using the blade. And that is literally all we need in terms of the jumper. Or rather in terms of the length of the jumper wire. But what I'm going to do is... I'm just going to basically shape this now. in kind of a hook shape a circle if I, can, if I can get it but a hook shape will do that is a tight circle I'm going to sit that just there And that's basically just recreated that pad. So I'll zoom in out. What I'm going to do now is just clean it off. Once again, there's a lot of cleaning involved when it comes to this kind of work. Especially when you're running jumper wires and things. Because what I need to do now is... I need to solder a new resistor to that. And the way I need to solder the resistor is going to be with hot air. Now the problem is if I use hot air it's going to melt the leaded solder that I've just put down. And that jumper wire is going to go flying. It's going to disappear into the fifth dimension. So what I need to do is I need to stop that from happening. Um, basically the way I'm going to do that is quite simple actually. I'm going to use some conformal coating and I'm going to basically glue the resistor down. So I'm going to take the resistor and just make sure that it fits first. Yep, that's going to that's gonna do it absolutely fine. So, it's just about the right size there, as you can see. And then I'm going to take some conformal coating. So, the stuff that I use is mechanic conformal coating. And it's this green stuff here. It's basically going to replace the solder mask that I've just got rid of. So, the solder mask I've just scraped away, it's going to replace that. I don't want stuff from all over the... Uh, bench on it though that's for certain but it's going to replace all of that conformal coating you really don't need much one of these tubes should last you pretty much forever to be honest if you use it right it should last you an awful long time you can see just how much i'm taking here i'm just going to basically paint it And um, what that's going to do is it's going to glue it all down and it's also going to seal it up because the case itself where this is pretty much going to touch 
is going to have some conductivity and I don't want that. I don't want it to be touching where it shouldn't do. So number one, it's going to protect it from conducting and number two, it's going to protect it from flying off when I do try and knock a drop a resistor down in a minute. So I'm going to use my UV laser and I know we've got a little bit of excess, but that's absolutely fine. But I'm going to use my UV laser and I'm going to basically cure it using UV light. Should only take around about 30 seconds or so. I'll fast forward through this process. But I'm basically just going to hold the light over and just let it cure out and harden. And there we go. That should be nice and solid. And that it is. So that's going to protect that now. But now I need to basically clean it up. So number one, I'm going to get rid of this excess. I should just pop right off. There we go. Not bothered about that ground pad. Not fussed about that. I'm going to clean up these bits here. Isopropyl alcohol will get rid of most of that. But the main thing I need to do is I need to expose some of this trace again to make it basically conductive again. So I'm going to zoom in. But I need to be able to solder to this. So I'm going to need to make it conductive. So I'm going to scrape it on the edge until I've re-exposed the end. There we go. So you can see that's exposed the copper inside the trace. And then I'm going to move my resistor out of the way because I want to clean it up around that area. So the resistor that I've still got in storage there, I'm going to move. And then once again, double of isopropyl alcohol, not a lot. Just give it a clean. It's going to be a tab more flux. And you see how dabbling that has just basically created a new pad there. So it would be difficult to see with the reflections, but it should be visible just. Same for the pad that is still there. Tin that. And let's get this resistor reinstalled. Okay, so I'm going to set my, my hot air to 460 degrees Celsius at 20% airflow. Remember, this is a very small component and we don't want it to fly off. I mean, it's not at the end of the world. I do have other donor boards, but I prefer not to. Um, I'm just going to slowly come in with the hot air. Okay. And you'll notice that while it is 1K, it should be soldered, and it should also be connected to both pads. Let's, let's just give it a clean and we'll find out. So I can inspect it a little bit closer then. Again, it's upside down, but I really do not mind. All right, so let's just ensure, because I can see that the trace goes down to the next resistor in line. So I'm gonna be sure that we're actually getting continuity from the bottom of that one resistor to the next point in the circuit. So I'm going to tap the top of the resistor. And yep, so I'm not putting any pressure on that. And um, we are getting continuity across the line. So we definitely got continuity there. We have definitely got a completed circuit and we have definitely solved that trace issue. So let's move on then. So I don't think there's any more damage to any components around here. However, we do still have the minor thing here where we've got some damage to components here. So let's just test a few things around here and make sure that they're good. So first of all, I'm gonna make sure that we don't have a short to ground on this cap here. So there's a test point there, I don't think we do. It looks like that cap 
yeah, that cap's not connected either, so that part there is ground, but that cap's not connected, so that was definitely damaged. We don't have a short to ground there, and that the zero ohm link is good. So is the coil. So let's just replace that one cap. It's probably not necessary, but I'm going to replace it anyway. So we shouldn't have any major trace issues here with this one. This is a much bigger trace. And it's not as badly burnt as well. Actually, it's probably not a bigger trace. But it's not as bad. Caps don't tend to go as bad to a point where they're going to damage the trace that much. But resistors do. Hmm, maybe I spoke too soon there. Well, I'll be damned. Well, I'll be damned. The trace is burnt away. Okay, well, we'll do the same with this one then. Uh, actually, we might not need to on this one, saying that. We might not need to run a jumper wire. Now, yes, it is a fairly wide trace. It is a fairly thick trace, but... I think... Yeah, we've still got the pad there. So we've still got a little bit of the pad there, which is absolutely fine. So I'll be able to get a capacitor soldered to that. And it's not going to cause any issues. I am going to expose a little bit more of the trace itself. But it shouldn't have any issues in terms of... Soldering a new cap to that. Might be a case where this chip needs replacing. I don't know what that chip actually does though. One thing I do know is it's very close to where the power management IC would be. And it's also very close to the fan circuit. Now, could it be a cap that's related to thermal temperatures or thermal sensors? Possibly. Alright, so I'm going to try and tin this up. If I can. Well, let's try and not get some random hairs all over it. Oh yeah, very visible damage there. But yeah, as you can see there, I did manage to get a little blob. So I should be able to steal a capacitor from a donor board and drop it on there. But this is going to have to go on an angle. So without sitting there and creating a new pad like I did with the other one, it's not going to look great, but I don't think it's necessary in this case because we can get a connection there. A little bit of a mess here, but that's fine. Let's pop the NAND back on. It's not going to boot without the NAND, so let's pop it on. Uh, one thing I need to do as well is just clear up this game card reader, so I'll just get rid of the corrosion that's on here. A bit of isopropyl alcohol and the toothbrush should do that fine. And um, we should be good. So let's get this back in the housing. Um, let's connect it up with everything connected exactly like it was before. The only thing I'm not going to connect up is probably the heat sink. So if I have to take the board back out, then I've got to replace the thermal paste again. And that ends up as a waste of money. We're getting no display. Why are we getting no display? We have backlight. We have no display. Don't tell me I've broken the game card reader. Uh, not the game card reader, the display connector. Nope. LCD connector is not damaged. Okay, I'm thinking possibly replace this chip. I could have damaged it. Uh, yeah, I'm going to replace this. I don't know what it is, but I could have possibly damaged that while I was fixing this area. That is a possibility. That's a lot of balls.
Okay, so let's add a bit of flux. Okay, and I'm going to use some solder braid to clean up the pads. I've got a feeling this is some sort of PMIC. I did nip it by the look of it in the corner. I'm going to grab one from a donor. This one will do nicely. So this is a BGA chip, so it's not going to be the easiest task in the world to replace. So I've got to take the chip off, reboil it, and then put a new put it onto the board I'm working on, which is a bit of a pain. Unless I can use the split method, which nope, that didn't go as planned. So. Definitely not going to be able to do that. Okay, so I'll just replace that with some leady solder there. Let's take some wick. Okay, so now I'm going to take my Nintendo Switch stencil. I'm going to line that up. Perfect. I'm going to take some solar paste. Okay. And finally, I'm just going to move the rest of this out of the way. And that should be good to go. So I'm going to set my hot air to 360 degrees. And let's start at a, no, at a nice low temperature. And I'm going to throw this solar paste down. It is low melt solar paste. Let that settle. Hmm. Might have failed.
add a bit of flux and I'm going to reflow this at normal temperature 460 degrees Celsius there we go beautiful nicely reboiled Add a bit of flux and I'm going to drop back down to 10% airflow to start flowing this down. Okay, that's locked in. Let's increase to 40% now. There we go. That should be good. So I'm going to let that cool down. And hopefully that's good now. Just give it a whirl. So assuming that for the first time ever I haven't damaged an LCD um, ribbon with the way that I use to get these in. There shouldn't really be many reasons why it wouldn't work. <laughs> it was up here, I say I damaged it. <laughs> That's funny. That's pretty funny. I must admit. <laughs> Oh God! Wow! Right, I need a cup of coffee. I'm absolutely baking in this workshop. Honestly, it's 26 degrees. Sorry, 34 degrees right now. Let me just show you. So we take a look here. I've got my BGA station, and that's reading 34 degrees on that uh, on that temperature sensor. So, I mean, you can see how shiny my head is. I'm absolutely sweltering. It's just way too hot. So, yeah, what I'm going to do. Because this was on 19% charge, so I'm going to sit here, and well I'm not going to sit here, I'm going to let this sit here and charge up on the charger. So I want to charge the battery anyway, I'm going to take a 15 to 20 minute break, but I want to charge the battery before I do anything. So let's just leave that to charge up and uh, then when I get back in 10 to 15 minutes I'll disconnect everything, reconnect everything back up properly and then we'll give it a full test. So for you it's going to be literally a couple of seconds. Right, okay. So I'm going to get everything reconnected up properly now. I want to monitor the current, current usage so I'm going to connect it up with the bench power supply. So we've got everything in by the look of it. Everything is connected, so let's monitor current draw now. That's better. That is better. That went to 800 milliamps. Uh, Oh, damn it, we need the uh, SD card, don't we?
I forgot about that. Yeah, that's a much better current draw. Yeah, one amp. Oh, wow. He turned off. Is that the bench supply? Could be. Hmm, what have I got my current draw set to on this? Alright, well now I've just set it to 5 amps. Because it was doing that on the other one as well, I'm wondering if I accidentally set it too low. Yes, indeed. Damn it. It's not working. <laughs> Joy cons are not working. That current draw is way better. So much better. Look at the difference. There we go. It's booting. It's booting the games. There we go. I need to replace the thermal paste. Because that's getting a little bit warm. Yeah. Tell you what else is getting warm me it is so hot today this is the hottest day i believe this is the hottest day that the uk has ever seen in september so just for context it is the 7th of september and right now it's reporting as 34 degrees celsius inside this workshop so it's pretty darn hot it's pretty darn hot okay and that's starting to cool down And that's not lagging anymore. That's not lagging anymore. Oh, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. Yeah. Let's try another game. Look at how much more responsive it is. This one wasn't loading either. So this one did freeze on the uh, on the Joy-Con connection um, screen. Yeah, that's done. That's working absolutely perfectly. That's fantastic news. Straight away that is booting up. Right, well, that just about does it then, ladies and gents. Another problem solved. That is absolutely awesome. Right, so let me just get rid of this. So I am a little bit shocked because I wasn't confident with this until I actually saw the damage. So the only explanation that I've got really is that the one bad resistor, because of the resistor being basically infinite resistance, because it wasn't really connected, the console thought it was too hot, and for that reason, it's obviously downclocking the CPU. Uh, I say obviously, that's my theory. I could be wrong. If you know any different, please, by all means, let me know in the video in the uh, comments down below, because uh, I'd love to know the exact reason. But that is my theory that the CPU was being downclocked because of an increased resistance on one resistor because of liquid damage. 
and basically that increased resistance was telling the system that the console was overheating and that it needed to downclock the CPU to cool itself down. That's my theory. The way that I come to that conclusion was by monitoring the power consumption during boot up and during gameplay. And I did notice that it wasn't quite right. It was basically not ramping up above one amp, which is not normal. And basically that comes down to experience. And it also comes down to the fact that I've got this breakout cable. This is why I tell people, break a 20 pound battery or whatever it costs you for the battery. Take one from a spares and repairs machine. Break the battery, make yourself a cable. Because these things, I'm telling you now, this will pay for itself after one job. It really will. Even if it saves you 20 minutes of time of charging. Because, yes, I don't like these consoles to go back out until they're fully charged, but I can fully charge this over the next two days because these are not going back to London until Thursday. It's Tuesday today. And these are not going back to London until Thursday. So I don't have to sit here and wait for 20 minutes for it to charge up just to be able to test it. And if I'd have had to keep rebooting it that many times with the battery, it would have killed the battery because it was only on about 19% when I got the console onto the bench. So trust me, they pay for themselves. Destroy a battery. It doesn't matter. I know it's not good for the environment. I understand that. But in a, in a way, it kind of is. Think about it. If you don't have to sit there waiting, wasting time, that's time that you're spending on other devices or the time that you're spending on this device to bring the device back to life and keep it out of landfill. So yes, you destroy a battery, you fix a console. <laughs> it's common sense. But yeah, you've heard my theory. I would love to know yours. If you think any different, by all means, let me know down in the comments down below. I am always open to new explanations, but that is my theory. Uh, so obviously by fixing the water damage, by running a little jumper, and then by replacing that one BGA chip, that which I caused a tiny little nicking uh, which is just here. You can see how small they are. Oh, whoops, I've dropped it. There you go. <laughs> Never mind. It's around there somewhere, but that's that's dead anyway. But yeah, by replacing those components and then by replacing this VGA chip here, I'm assuming some sort of a power management IC, uh, this console appears to be working perfectly fine. And the customer, I'm sure, is going to be very, very happy. But that's going to be it for this video. If you have any comments or questions, leave them down in the comment section down below. I will always do my best to answer. If you want to organise your own repair, you can do so by using the website address in the video description, consolefix.co.uk. That will take you to my booking page and things where you can book your own repair. And basically, this particular job I will be charging £65 for, which is basically my standard liquid damage fee. But this particular job, standard liquid damage fee, £65. Uh, I've actually spent more than an hour on this, which is above my normal amount of time which I spend on devices. But I am streaming, I am recording, it's baking hot outside and I can't sit in the workshop all day. So I have to I have to take regular breaks for my own health and safety. But, yep, yeah, this job will cost the customer £65. So if you are wondering how much this particular job does cost, that is it. Uh, so if you want to organise your own repair, you can do so by getting in touch using the... Uh, website address in the video description you can also contact me through that website as well if you want to get a quote for a particular job and i will get back to you usually within 24 hours during the week but like i said if you have any comments or questions leave them down in the comment section down below i will always do my best to answer and if you enjoy this type of content then be sure to hit the subscribe button and turn on the bell notifications so that you're notified whenever i upload if you want to support the channel you can do so by using the patreon link in the video description you can become a channel member and patreon members and channel members all get early access to these videos. You can also use the Amazon affiliate links. They do give me a little bit of a kickback in commission. And if you set one of those links as a bookmark, then of course that will help me out every time you use Amazon. It won't cost you anything extra, but it does help out the channel. But that's going to be it for this video. Thank you very much for watching. And until next time, I'll see you later. Bye for now.